So uh, welcome back, everybody. So we will now start the um, uh, final session of our, our day talking about neurotechnology and, and society. And it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Hervé, who is a, a, a speaker, who is a local speaker. <laughs> uh, Hervé is a neurologist and a neuroscientist uh, who is working uh, at uh, CNRS. Uh, he's been involved in uh, neurogenetic research on disease such as the cerebellar ataxia and then the molecular mechanisms involved in astrocyte phenotype and plasticity. Uh, he has a uh, multiple uh, position uh, uh, around um, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, in particular, bioethics uh, uh, framework. And uh, in particular, he was part of the um, uh, he was the chairman of the UNESCO International Bioethics Committee from 2014 to 2021. Uh, and he's an expert since uh, 2015 uh, for OECD on neurotechnology. So we look very much forward to your presentation. And Hervé, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much to you um, uh, for the invitation and also to uh, Karen, it's a fantastic uh, day. Uh, so my declaration of links of interest, I am a neuroscientist, neurobiologist, and uh, several affiliations in, neuro et in ethics that are listed here, but I have no uh, fin financial interest in any part of the following uh, presentation. So as you know, uh, now everything about neurotechnology and I use here the definition that uh, with uh, many colleagues, several of them in the room, uh, we use uh, with uh, the report at OECD uh, as the various device and procedure to access, monitor, study, evaluate, manipulate, and mimic the structure and function of nervous system. And we uh, know uh, perfectly that <coughs> We need to develop this technology. We need them for unmet needs, especially in the field of uh, brain disorders, whether they are neurological disorders or mental disorders. Uh, just remember that brain disease represents one third of our health expenditure, and many of them are still without solution. Uh, I just take this picture for Stephanie, because she was involved in this work, uh, making some paraplegic uh, guy walking through decoding uh, brain activity in the regions of intentions of uh, moving and sending the signals in the uh, spinal cord to allow autonomous walk. But on the same way, this raise uh, questions about uh, identity. And we know for long with uh, brain implants that you can change the mood or the way people are behaving with these uh, implants Parkinson, in Parkinson's disease. Physical and mental integrity, autonomy, and many other ethical and societal concerns. Particularly when all these technologies are used out of the field of health, uh, for example, for militaries and uh, the US uh, Department of Research of the Army, DARPA, uh, already spent two billion on these, or big companies. And I just mentioned here a project of Meta on brain to text. So what you saw on one of the slides of <coughs> Karen with implants, but the same without implants. So all these led uh, works uh, starting in 2015, especially at OECD, uh, raising uh, the recommendation of 2019. And some other works were developed at UNESCO uh, uh, with a report on ethical issues of neurotechnology in 2021. So, I'm not going to elaborate on the OECD uh, recommendations because Laura, just after me, will do so. But I want to insist that these uh, recommendations were done in the uh, view of responsible innovation. So how to develop this technology a responsible way. And they include 
basic aspect of safety and efficacy, but also many aspects of public engagement and anticipation about the regulators and anticipation about the potential misuse. The important thing is that such recommendations uh, for at least the states that are at uh, OECD need to be implemented. And I'm going to present to you how they were implemented in France. Uh, we uh, decided to gather all the actors, or at least almost all the actors, uh, so the public and the private sectors, but also patients associations and many regulators, and to <clears throat> try to co-elaborate, co-construct a charter. And uh, it took us one year and a half to do so. And in 2022, we had this charter with an engagement uh, to preserve human identity, freedom of thought, autonomy, cognitive liberty, mental privacy, and the right to oppose to any non-consensual or abuse use of their personal data and any kind of uh, manipulation of the brain. So how to do so? Five engagement of the actors. The first engagement is to protect personal brain data by committing uh, with clear, accessible, rigorous information about not only the collection and use of the data uh, when they are collected, but also about their storage, their potential dissemination, their potential sharing, and the possibility to have the right to refuse so, and particularly sharing, and the right to uh, have the possibility to erase uh, their data if they need so. Engagement number two, to ensure reliability, safety, and security of medical and non-medical device when they will be used to help for education or other aspect. So how to protect from external intrusions, how to demonstrate the effectiveness. It's something we perfectly know in the field of clinical uh, health application, but when they are used outside of the health, how to demonstrate on uh, scientific grounds the effectiveness, how to ensure the reversibility, Karen and uh, <coughs> previous uh, uh, presenters uh, show you the uh, caricatural case of second side with these retinal implants uh, that are uh, still in the eye of 300 people, how to uh, collect the feedback from the user. You have already listened about this important with Jen and with Karen of the interactions with the user. Engagement number three, to develop an ethical and deontological communication to avoid unrealistic expectation on one side and conversely unfounded fears, to have scientific evidence and communicate this scientific evidence and to uh, try to make transparency about the algorithms to prevent bias. Engagement four, prevent misuse and malicious applications uh, so, obviously, uh, take any measures to prevent intrusive surveillance and uh, try to anticipate, detect, and block activities intended to influence the decision-making process. Finally, number five, uh, take, to take into account societal expectation by committing to tackle real needs we want in the field of health, real health and not cosmetics, uh, and how to promote inclusiveness, prevent discrimination, participate in the societal dialogue, and uh, take measures to promote access and recognize the importance of this diversity and this uh, accessibility. So at the present time, we have already 32 organizations that not only the first day, but then, uh, now it's one year and a half, going on, 32 organizations that join and that are now signatories of this charter. And the interesting thing is that it's well, from the academic uh, sector in CERN, CNRS, but also for the private sector. Most of them are small companies, startups, but also some big ones, Sanofi now join. Patients associations, uh, such as Alzheimer or Parkinson. 
uh, funders of the research, like Fondation Fundamentale or uh, some other, and regulators, like Agence de la Biomédecine, and, the, uh, and also some uh, uh, unions, uh, unions of the industries that are making the health device, like SNITEM. So a variety of factors that joined with uh, the charter. And now we are moving to a European charter and we are moving more or less the same way. You have some actors of the writing of the European charter in the room. Uh, we have the support of the European Brain Council, but also of several professional organizations like the Federation of European Neuroscience Societies or Neurological Societies, uh, regulators or funders like Erenet Neuron or uh, the, ethics, the European groups of ethics. And once again, starting from the French text, we are going to co-construct and to elaborate a French a European charter that will be open to signature for more companies, uh, academies, associations, and regulators. So now I'm going to move to the work that we have done at uh, UNESCO and that we are continuing to do. Uh, at the beginning, we were producing this report, and I'm not going to elaborate more on the report because it's uh, available now for three years and you can find it easily on the website of UNESCO. But the main point is that we wanted to explore the ethics uh, issues of this neurotechnology. And now the, the facet, the angle, is the human rights. How this neurotechnology and the development of neurotechnology impact human rights. And uh, because of discussions uh, with colleagues, you have most likely seen on one current slide the Morning Star group. Uh, do we need new rights because of the new technology? You know the Hans Jonas proposals that a new an emerging technology need a new ethics. Uh, and it could be that new technologies such as neurotechnology need new rights. Uh, so our report was once again recognizing the importance of neurotechnology because reading or writing the brain is something that will impact our identity, freedom of thought, autonomy, privacy, and human flourishing. We have uh, another view uh, in, the in the report of the various uh, techniques. Importantly, we included also EI, uh, and you will see later why it's important to include also EI. So not only directly the recording or, or changing, but also uh, the way we analyze the data. And obviously, we are listing a number of ethical issues. I have no time this afternoon to go into the details, but you it, it was also already mentioned by uh, colleagues, uh, questions of uh, mental and physical integrity, personal identity, freedom of thought. I'm going to insist on one that is particularly important, uh, the one of the interest of the child, because the brain of of child is not a small adult brain. It's a brain in development. And an adolescent brain is a brain in reshaping. So it's very important to see also the ethical issues and impact of use of neurotechnology for these uh, specific populations uh, because uh, neurogaming or neuroeducation is going to be targeted to this population. So obviously we have the uh, main issue of privacy we want to keep our thought private. In Europe, we have GDPR, but it's not enough, clearly. And even if you carefully look to Article 4, with what are the personal data, or Article 9, what are the sensitive data, they are related to health. So if our brain data are collected outside of a health context, at this time, it's not considered at personal sensitive data. It should be. And obviously I return once again on the brain of children and of adolescents because it's even more important to uh, foresee what kind of impact on the development and what kind of impact for the future uh, adults there will be 
uh, and, uh, and what kind of influence on their um, way to take decision and also to, to uh, grow as responsible adults. One important domain that we explored was the domain of the impact of neurotechnology on law. Because all our system, I'm not discussing if it's uh, the best way or not, but all our legal system is based on our freedom of thought, on our cognitive liberty, on our free will. You are going to be judged on the fact that what you did, you did it with the freedom to do it, with the free will to do it, with the cognitive liberty. If we question, if we bias this domain, we are going to completely uh, destroy all the edifice of law that were built in our country. So there is questions uh, there, and also the, with law, the questions of democracy. So obviously, we, uh, in our report, we have many uh, conclusions, but one specific of the conclusion is the specificity of the brain data and the fact that we need to consider them as sensitive personal data. Uh, and um, we need to engage discussions with the various actors, something very important, the society as a whole, and to see if, as a conclusion, we need new rights. In our report, we consider that uh, the, the potential impact on uh, integrity, privacy, etc., uh, we can collectively put all these under the, uh, the name of neural rights, and it should be important to consider them as neural rights. But on the contrary to some of our colleagues, we consider that these rights are enshrined in existing rights, and that uh, a proliferation of rights should be more counterproductive than mm -hmm. efficient. We need to consider them as sensitive rights, more or less the same way as, for example, you have reproductive rights, the right to abortion or the right to access to medically assisted procreation. All these are constituting the reproductive rights. But it's new, not uh, new human rights. It's not different from uh, exercising your free will to decide for your own uh, views on your own life. And finally, we recommended UNESCO to uh, use its uh, unique global mandate uh, to go further and to examine if the uh, legal instrument of the human rights are clearly adapted to the uh, field of neurotechnology. For example, uh, mental integrity is something extremely important, but uh, physical integrity is usually used in human rights instruments. So how to revise the, this instrument to be sure that uh, the, the rights are covering the right field? We were heard by UNESCO states and in the General Assembly in 2023, uh, it was decided to move on to a recommendation of neuro on neurotechnology that should be the twin recommendation with the one already uh, produced on EI. You know that the International Bioethics Committee already produced several in universal declarations, universal declaration on uh, genome and human rights, universal declaration on bioethics. This should be, on a way, the universal declaration on the brain. Uh, and uh, UNESCO uh, convene a group, a group of uh, 24 experts, and I, have the, I had the, the pleasure and the, the chance to be part of, uh, of the experts called for this group. Uh, my colleagues uh, uh, made me a co-chair of the, this group. Um, so I'm going to present to you now uh, the first draft of these recommendations and what are the main points that we consider. First, we consider uh, the, the definition of neurotechnology more or less the same way as before. We are the same people. Uh, and, uh, but we, we want also to include the mechanisms or the techniques or the devices that are going to be 
able to infer sensor, motor, and mental state. I told you before that EI was important. The, the nervous system is not only the brain, and we need to consider all the part of the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, but also the other aspect of the nervous system, autonomic, enteric, and nervous system. Uh, we, uh, some, some people uh, often say that our belly or the enteric system is our second brain. It's very important to have a holistic view of the nervous system. And another aspect which is very important is to take into consideration the whole life cycle of technology from the very beginning, early stage of research to the end, including the monitoring, evaluation, validation, how it's used uh, on the long range, and uh, the disassembly and the termination. It's extremely important because of all the materials that are used uh, for uh, these uh, techniques and uh, the environmental impact that it could be at the uh, making of or at the dismantling of the technology. We used for our definition two dimensions. One, about neural data, and we give a definition of what we mean by neural data. Quantitative data about the structure, activity, and function of the nervous system. But we also added the concept of cognitive biometric data that include nerve, ne neural data plus some other data that when collected and combined, we also already I heard Olivier uh, Oulier told, taking, uh, told, um, talking about multimodality. When combined, are going to allow some inference on our mental states or on our af cognitive, affective, and cognitive state. Because this is all what we want to protect. So what are the main values that we uh, promote in the draft? Obviously, basic human rights values, human dignity, promotion of health, well-being, and making the benefit of neurotechnology development accessible, the dimension of solidarity. We have the clear opposition nowadays between the individuals and the community. We need things with solidarity, we need things with knowledge sharing. We need that the community is also involved. And we absolutely need the technology uh, to prevent, to avoid exacerbating or generating new inequalities. Obviously, we need responsibility and accountability of the various actors. And finally, because it's essential today, we need sustainability because we know that all these devices will consume, especially with the eye, a lot of energy and a lot of rare materials. What are the ethical principles and human rights at stake in our draft? Beneficence, proportionality, do no harm. The possibility of self-determination and freedom of thought. The privacy, mental privacy and protection of neural data. Trustworthiness, uh, uh, we return to the question of effectiveness. Fairness and non-distribution, epistemic and global justice, interest of the child, and protection of future generation. Um, what are specifically target of vulnerable populations? I already mentioned children and adolescents, obviously elderly people because of the importance of age-appropriate and context-appropriate product. Person with a physical disability, we have seen movies uh, with these exoskeletons, uh, we, and, and the neurotechnology were first developed for sensory, sensorial um, deficits, such as ear uh, deafness and or blindness. Mental disability, and in this field of mental disabilities, the question is multifaceted from the early diagnosis of the autistic spectrum to the difficulties on the long term uh, of uh, adaptation, maladaptation, or addictions to the device. And finally, uh, gender issues. 
some main point of attention for policy actions because obviously we are developing a framework for states to implement in their own regulations and laws. We want them to prioritize health uh, and health applications, especially for unmet needs in the field of mental disorders and neurological disorders. We want clear regulations for clinical trials in the field. We want rigorous assessment of risk benefits and strive for cooperation and equity. We need absolutely uh, to uh, define neural and cognitive biometric data as sensitive personal data uh, to uh, go for their protection for collection, processing, and use and reuse. Second element, we have blurring lines now between uh, the questions of augmentations and uh, care, especially for non-clinical applications, how to regulate these questions of uh, enhancement and augmentation and how to respect some freedom, how to make an effective communication uh, and comprehensive stakeholder engagement. Uh, and also we have uh, several recommendations for the applications in educational settings, in the workplace, consumer applications, uh, and also open questions for intellectual property, private uh, and public private uh, instruments, cyber security and safety. So all this is now in the air, it's already available. Uh, there is now a public consultation, a public and open consultation on the document. This consultation will go from uh, the 1st of June, so it's already a couple of weeks. Uh, it will run until the 12th of July. You can go on the UNESCO website, you can read the draft. And once again, it's a draft. You can comment, you can comment in various uh, um, uh, chapter by chapter. It's completely open, so we have no, uh, if you want to be highly critical uh, with the text, there is no problem with that. Uh, we are going to take everything uh, in the second half of July, use EI to analyze the multiple uh, uh, recommendations and, re and, and feedback that we will receive, try to work on that in August, uh, the, the group, the Commission, will convey the last week of August and we will produce a new draft, a new text. And this new text will go to states and uh, um, states will go to deliberation and we hope that the final text on the recommendations will be adopted uh, at the General Assembly of 2025. That said, thank you so much for your attention.